Well, good morning, Canyon Springs. Would you stand with me, please? And welcome our Facebook friends and brothers and sisters in Christ that are worshiping with us today. Thank you so much for being part of our family. The first song, Living for Jesus, and I'm sure that's exactly what you're doing. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do. Allegiance, glad-hearted and free, this is a pathway of blessings for me. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be thy throne, my life I give, it's for to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Living for Jesus, who died in my place, bearing on Calvary, my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to answer His call. Follow His leading and give Him my all. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be thy throne. My life I give is for to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Living for Jesus wherever I am, doing each duty in His holy name, willing to suffer affliction or loss, deeming each trial a part of Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be Thy throne, my life I give is for to live. O Christ, for Thee alone, living for Jesus through earth's little while, my dearest treasure, the light of His smile, seeking the lost one He died to redeem, bringing find rest in Him. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be Thy throne. My life I give, it's for to live, O Christ, for Thee alone. <clears throat> and He hideth my soul in His love, I'm sure. A one 
wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand a wonderful savior is jesus my lord he taketh my burden away he holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand with numberless blessings each moment he crowned and filled with his fullness divine I sing in my rapture, oh, glory to God for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand when clothed in his brightness transported i ride to meet him in clouds of the sky his perfect salvation is wonderful love. I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand and you may be seated well amen <laughs> good singing what a great song that is he hideth my life and he says, in the depths of his love. Think about that for a moment. Our life is hid in the depths of God's love. That's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Well, we're glad that you're here this morning. And we trust that God has already blessed you uh, with the singing and the preaching and the teaching that you're about to receive. We're glad that you're here visiting with us. And uh, we've got guests and people from all over the country, we've got folks that traveled from Ohio to be here. Amen. Thank you for being here. And uh, we're just glad that you're here. We hope that uh, your experience here will be a blessing. If there's anything that we can do to be a blessing or help to you, uh, by all means, would you just go ahead and let us know that? And then uh, that would be wonderful. There's a connection card in front of you in the chair. And uh, feel free to fill that out and put that in the offering plate. Our offering plate... Uh, is uh, we have an offering box out there in the foyer, and you can use that at any time. I just want to kind of go over some of the things. If you've received one of our bulletins, um, I'm getting, Marissa, I'm getting a lot of feedback back here. I don't know 
it's not the good kind of feedback that we like, but <clears throat> maybe a little bit of the bad kind of feedback. I don't know. But um, uh, I want to go over a couple upcoming things here that, are, that you see in your bulletin. Of course, we've got our Wednesday evening. This is a great Bible study time. We have a great meal together. And uh, we, on Wednesdays at 6 o'clock, encourage you to be a part of that summer Bible fellowship right there. And then uh, for some of you that haven't got connected already with our instant church directory, this is a great way to connect with each other and meet new people. Uh, and you'll be able to pray for one another. You'll have their contact information there. And if you have any questions about that, you can see me or Diane Hinkle. Typically, they're not here this morning, but they're typically sitting right over here. Uh, and she can help you get that set up. And uh, it's basically a great opportunity uh, to pray for one another. And maybe you want to call somebody up and say, hey, you know, hey, you want to go out to breakfast on this day? Well, their phone number would be in there. And so it's just a great way for all of us to connect with one another. So be thinking about that. That's an opportunity. If you'd like to be involved in that, please let us know. That would be really, really great. Uh, also, uh, we are working on some of the ladies' ministries, and we're putting uh, some things together. And uh, so you be in prayer about that. And we call it the Blessings and Brunch. That's coming up September 3rd right there. And uh, you go ahead and go ahead and mark your calendar. I believe there's a sign-up sheet out there in the foyer for that. And uh, we're going to be letting you know more information about that as we get just a little bit closer. And uh, one of the things that we love to do here at Canyon Springs is teach God's Word. And we think it's really important that <clears throat> when folks are interested in our church and what it takes to become a member of our church, what we have is a class, we call it the core class. What are the core beliefs of Canyon Springs? What are we about? What's our heartbeat? What are, what, what's our philosophy? And so we have a class. And it's, um, you say, well, when is that class, Pastor? Well, uh, I was thinking about this and I thought, well, it doesn't really matter when it is because it is right after the Sunday morning service. So you're already here anyways, amen, and we'll just feed you. That's what we'll do. Uh, but uh, sign up. There is a sign-up sheet, and we'll announce the dates for that. And we'll just have it right after the morning service. It takes about an hour and a half or so. We get a great meal. We sit down in a small group environment, talk about our church, talk about our church history, talk about everything. And uh, we have a great class, talk about some of the major things that are, we think are very, very core and very important to our churches. So that's an opportunity for you. If you're interested, you say, Pastor, is there any commitments? Do I have to give my credit card when I come through the door? No, no commitments. Uh, this is very informational. So this is for you so that as you're praying about what church family, what spiritual family you're going to be a part of, uh, this is all the information about what we're all about and how we go about our businesses. So we want to make sure you have all of that information as you'll be praying about where God wants you to have a spiritual family. And we believe here that every, every person needs three homes. We need a uh, spiritual home, a home in heaven, if you will, and that's through salvation. We think you ought to have a good home uh, with your family and your kids and a roof over your head. And we think you ought to have a spiritual home. That's where your family is, your church family and we think those are so very, very important. So we want you to be thinking about those kinds of things. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and sign up. And then we're going to be letting you know the dates of that as we get just a little bit closer. Um, let me see. Another thing that we've got going on is in the month of September, I want you to be thinking about Friend Day. We're going to, we're going to ask you to show us your friends. Say, Pastor, I don't have any. Go make one. So this is how, you know, the, the, the old adage is, uh, you know what? Show me a man's friends and I'll show you that man's character. So here, I'm, I'm challenging you. Uh, I'm just kidding. But you know what? Uh, we all have friends and we all have people uh, that we would like to come to church with us. This is a special opportunity for you to say, hey, uh, my church is having a friend day. We want to. Uh, would, would love for you to come with me and we're going to have a special gift for every friend that comes and it's just going to be really really exciting and we're working on some things already going to have a nice little gift bag for everyone 
And so we're going to have a very special day on that September 25th. And so we'll have all the information on the helps for you. And we did talk a little bit about giving, and there's also lots of different ways that you can give. And I want to say thank you for those of you that have sacrificed and given especially to our building project. Praise the Lord. You know what? We're almost complete. I mean, we got just a few things with the sound booth, a few things with some of these things that are happening. But it is coming down towards the end. And you know what? The Lord is taking care of us. And you know what? Through your giving. And we do appreciate that. I want to thank all of those that have uh, uh, gave online. Many, many that uh, are all over the world have been given uh, to our ministry. We uh, broadcast on YouTube and Facebook. And we've got a lot of people that love us around the world and help us. And so we're very thankful for that. I want to say thank you to you for being a part of those things. Well, I, I, I think there's something else that we need to kind of deal with, Mike. We've got a birthday here. And uh, Mike, get ready to sing happy birthday to Hudson. Hudson, come on up here, Hudson. All right, so. Okay, Hudson, happy birthday to you. Come on up. You, you only get this if you come up here. He, oh, he did. All right, let's sing happy birthday to Hudson, okay? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Hudson. Happy birthday to you. I was just I was just looking to see how he's blushing. Yeah, yeah. He, and he's a lot richer, amen? He asked me up here, he says, could you let everyone else know they can give me cash too? That's what he said up here. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I'm sure he wouldn't refuse it. I'm sure he wouldn't refuse it. Happy birthday, Hudson. God bless you. That's actually tomorrow. And, uh, and uh, I know, I hope you have a great, great, great day there. All right, let's stand together. Let's sing a little bit. The way of the cross leads home. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. I must needs go on in the blood sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the heights sublime where the soul is at home with God, the way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. And I bid farewell to the way of the world to walk in it evermore. For my Lord says, come, and I seek my home where he waits at the open door. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. And you may be seated. We're going to have our scripture reading uh, in the book of Acts, chapter number 11. If you'd like to make your way over there, Acts chapter number 11. If you'd like to grab the pew Bible in front of you or maybe underneath the chair in front of you, uh, feel free to follow along with us today. Acts chapter number 11, and we're going to be reading. 
the scripture portion is going to be beginning in verse number 19. Acts chapter 11, verse number 19. Now when they were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came, had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. And he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people were added unto the church or unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first. In Antioch. And in the days uh, came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them, Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And let's have a word of prayer. We'll have a special, and then we'll dive into the message. Lord, we ask that you take your word and use it this morning. and Use uh, me as a vessel. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would guide my words and my speech. And Lord, as our hearts are so bombarded with so many different things this week, so many different things this morning. Oh Lord, would you help us focus upon what you would have for us today? Lord, we thank you for this place. We thank you for these people. We ask the Lord that you would meet us here and change us through your word. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Jesus have fled. 
Acts chapter number 11, and uh, I I think today um, is going to be a blessing to you. My heart's desire is that we catch a little of these truths that we read about in this chapter 11. And uh, let me just say this, uh, the human uh, being is quite resilient. Um, Those of you that have been in Arizona very long, you recognize there's not... We're really, we could be tough, we could be resilient, and uh, we only need a few things like uh, water, amen, and uh, food, and uh, raiment, right? We need those things, and, and air conditioning, amen? <laughs> there, that's like the necessity, amen? We've come to say we need that air conditioning. It's a basic right, Amen. It's a basic right for all individuals to have air conditioning, right? Well, I'm just reminded that there's some things that we may think are basic, uh, but uh, might not necessarily be so. And uh, I want to talk to you about churches today. I want to talk to you about a church. I want to talk to you about this church, this church in Antioch. It's a great church. And, uh, but... Let me just say this, uh, not a perfect church. Um, There's no perfect churches. You know, why why is that? Now, I know what you're thinking. Don't think too much. But you're thinking, well, I know that pastor. (laughs) I know he ain't perfect. So therefore, there's no perfect churches because there's no perfect pastor. Partly true. Partly true. You know why else there's no perfect church? Because it's filled with people and there are no perfect people. I mean, we've got all of this situation where we're running around, we're doing things, and you know what? There are times that we fail. Every church has opportunities to grow in certain areas to be better. And uh, every church has uh, some things that aren't the greatest. They're, they're not the best. But by it all means, um, there are some basics of what a great church is. And here in this chapter, we, we're going to learn about them. And we're going to look at them. And we're going to say, wow, uh, maybe this is what we should be focusing on if we're going to be a great church great church i think there's some great churches doing great work today i think we're doing great work i think there's churches in america and churches in our culture churches around the world that are doing good good great work i think there's some churches that are not doing good and great work and we've got an example here in the scripture of a church that's some doing some great work it was a great great church and i want to talk about the basics if you will of what a great church is i want to talk about the basics and so here was this church in acts chapter 11 this is the church if you will is a a a turning point as we read about this in verse number 19 all the way towards the end of the chapter this is a turning point in history as we examine some interesting thoughts that we read about. Did you read in verse number 19? I thought it was interesting. Towards the end, they were preaching after Stephen. Uh, The persecuted people, the Jewish people were scattering because of persecution. And they began to, when they scattered, you know what they continued to do? Continue to preach. You know what? Sometimes we go through circumstances and persecution... And what happens is, is we shut down. We stop living. We stop living. Because we're going through something. We're going through some persecution. But I'm reminded of a, even though these believers around when Stephen was being persecuted and killed, if you will. And then they went to other places. They continued to preach. And so... I think it's an amazing thing. But did you notice at the end of verse 19 that they continue to preach? 
And they traveled to these different places. But the Bible says at the end of the verse, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews. And so this was a Jewish church. This was a Jewish message. And they didn't preach to the Gentiles. So a little bit later in this chapter, we're going to see Antioch is become one of many firsts. It was the first Gentile church. This is Antioch now. This was the first Gentile church. I know Cornelius was the first Gentile. The Holy Spirit came out. We're going to be studying that in chapter 10. But right here in Antioch, this was the first Gentile church. Now, we also have the fact that the Gentiles, they accepted, they were accepted in here. And, um, and, and this was the beginning of Paul's first missionary journey. This is where Paul came on the scene. And so this was a very important place. This was a great, great church. Uh, and it was a part of Paul's first missionary journey. This is amazing. Also, this church is the first place that people, the disciples, believers, if you will, were called Christians. That's pretty important. So this church, Antioch, was a great, great church. It was, if you will, if you read a little bit more, you'll see that they sent Barnabas and Paul back to Jerusalem and they became the center of evangelism for the Gentile church. This is amazing. This church was great. And so if we look at verse number 19 and verse number 20, I want you to see a couple observations and a couple principles and a couple things that set this church apart. Not only was this Paul's first public ministry, not only was, was this the first time the Jewish people were accepted, if you will. But this is a great picture of a great church. The basics, if you will. A marriage has some elements that need to be there, right? Family has some elements that need to be there. Let me just give you just a little off the, off the cuff here. Guess what? You want to have a family? You're going to need... You're going to need a man, and you're going to need a woman. That's how it works. Amen? And then you have some kids. And, and guess what? You can raise a family that way, and you need some elements. You, and every family needs a mom. Every family needs a dad. Amen? And so that's the elements of a good family, a mom and a dad and kids and and, and, and growing up in church and reading the Bible and, and moms and dads that love the Lord and bring their children up in the admonition of the Lord. Hey, those are the basics of uh, honoring God in your family. Those are the basics. People don't often, they want to change the basics. They want to change everything to make it more convenient, more easy, whatever. But... Here, we see this amazing church in Antioch. And we see the quality, of the basic quality that you and I, that we should be having in our personal life and our church should be having. So this church, look at verse 20 with me. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they come to Antioch spake unto the Grecians. And notice what they did. They preached Jesus. So they were preaching. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great and they turned unto the Lord. So what was happening here was that these men, they were under persecution. And they went out and they boldly proclaimed Jesus Christ. They were bold in their preaching. This is a basic element of any great church that they boldly proclaim Jesus. We've got we've got all sorts of different kinds of churches. We, I say that flippantly, but you know what? It's very hard pressed to hear Jesus's name in a sermon. 
They're proclaiming something. They're not proclaiming the Lord Jesus. And here was Antioch and these men. They could have been Jewish. They could have been Gentiles that were Jewish proselytes maybe. Or, or they were Jewish people that were just from these areas that were Gentile areas. Like, um, like he was talking about there. But they went and they began to preach. And they went and they said, hey, they spoke to the Grecians. who were the, They were Jew, uh, Gentiles. And they preached the Lord Jesus. They were bold in this. And the response to this boldness was great. I don't know about you. Uh, if somebody says to me, uh, hey, do you want to come over and play a game? I'd be like, hmm. Tell me more. <laughs> Explain that a little bit, and then I might give a good old maybe. But if they're bold, hey, listen, you want to come over and play a game? Guess what? It's the best game ever. And guess what? I got cookies. I'm like, cookies? Okay. Let's do it. I mean, but... Do you see what they did? They went to wherever they were at. They were persecuted. They were in rags. But they they boldly proclaimed that Jesus was Christ. And they were enthusiastic about it. And a great church is all about preaching the Lord Jesus and being bold and proclaiming his name. They were witnessing. They were telling them about Jesus. They were bringing them back to that local assembly. They were welcoming them. Now... Let me just give you a little meat for your on the bone here. This church, uh, this church was founded by the word of God. Look at verse nineteen. Now, when they were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose around Stephen, they traveled to Phanus, to Cyprus, and Antioch. And what did they preach? They preached the what? So in Antioch, the word of God was preached. So this is how it was founded. And then what happened? They preached the Lord Jesus. And then in verse number 20, what else? Ha- uh, excuse me, verse 20. And some of them were the men of Cyrus. Look at verse 21 with me. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed. So guess what? They preached the word of God. And God's power was on them as they preached. And many believe. So this is how churches start. This is how it happens. The word of God is important. But yet, isn't that the very thing that is going out from our Christian culture? The Bible's not really true. A lot of errors in the Bible. It's just, you know what? We need someone else to interpret it for us. And so we let all these really smart people that are smart, dumb tell us what God is saying. I'm pretty sure that my God's big enough and smart enough to make sure that I can have the very word of God. I'm pretty sure God can give me the Holy Spirit and help me so I know what God would desire of me. Amen. I don't need to ask anybody. I, I need to just dive into the Bible and ask God to illuminate it under my heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hey, We have the word of God and they preach the word of God and God's hand was upon them. You say, well, what, what does that mean? Does it mean his actual hand was upon them? No, that's the power. That's a symbol of God's power was on them when the preaching of God's word came. And when Jesus was preached, the Holy Spirit's power came and began to work and began to move and began to do good things there. And so that's the beginning of of that church and people turn unto the Lord. Look at verse 21. Notice what they did. And they turned unto the Lord. This is interesting. So this is how churches began. This is how a great church began. They preached the word of God. The God's power came through the Holy Spirit. They preached Jesus and people got saved, if you will. And notice what they did. They turned unto God. Antioch was a very vile and wicked, wicked place. 
it was quite the distance. Jerusalem was down south. Antioch is way up high in Syria, modern-day Syria now, almost all the way as you get up to Turkey. Very wicked, very vile. I mean, it was just filth all over the place. But notice it says they turn unto the Lord. And so the preachers were bold about preaching Christ. And maybe this is why we've got people not coming to Christ. Because we're not out here preaching the goodness of God, the greatness of God, and we're not doing it bold. We're like, yeah, he's pretty good to me. No, no, he's good. Oh, he'll save you. You know, we got to get bold about this and serious about this. We have people that were persecuted, boldly proclaiming the name of the Lord Jesus. And guess what? People saw that and said, I want that. And they turned, uh, they turned to the Lord. That word turn, another word uh, for that is converted. They were, they, they converted. They were over here worshiping idols and they turned to the one true God. Amazing. This is what a great church does. They boldly proclaim these things. I'm wondering, maybe sometimes the reason we get stuck in a rut is because we're not very bold about our faith. Nobody really knows where you stand. Nobody really knows uh, what's important to you. In this church... People were persecuted and the things that they were concerned about was preaching the Lord Jesus to people and proclaiming the gospel of the Lord. This church was a great church. They boldly proclaimed. And I think that's a plan for all of our, this is a plan for our church today. We need to, you know what? We need to proclaim the Lord Jesus. We need to exalt him and we need to tell people about his finished work and we need to teach God's word. And this is what we strive to do here. It is the power of God. We try to um, exalt the Lord Jesus, preach him boldly, and teach God's word. This is what churches should be doing. If a church doesn't have that, it's not going to please the Lord. I, I know. I, I know this because I've lived it. I've lived it in my, my generation. We've got churches that are watering down the gospel. Churches that where you can go to their service and you're not, maybe you might not even hear the gospel. We need to have a sign of a great church is exactly this. Boldly proclaiming Jesus is Lord. Do that in your life. We got churches doing all sorts of things. Dramas. Great. I like, I like, I like a good show. Music. I like good music. Funny people. I like funny people. I like events. I like activities. We got a lot of this stuff going on, but recognize the sign of a good church, the basics of a great church is not the drama club, is not the activities, is none of that. It is pro boldly proclaiming the Lord Jesus, it is exalting him and talking about him and his exalted work and preaching the very word of God and teaching the word of God to all People. This is why Paul told Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. He says, you got to preach that word. Don't compromise. You say, but that's old fashioned. Well, granted. Uh, I, I, I know uh, by experience there was a certain hairstyles that were real popular when I was a teenager. And they were out of fashion pretty, pretty quickly. And I know some were just held on a long time. You know, you met the people. They just held on a long time. Until they wouldn't hold on anymore. Right, Brother Joe? Wouldn't hold on anymore. Just. But now, guess what? That same style is coming back. It's coming back full circle. It's coming back. 
And now that's Ian now. I saw, I see the kids, I see some of the kids, I'm like, wow, it's back? I'm just, well, you know, maybe I should have stuck with it, I thought, you know, but no. But we got all of these fads that happen in our culture. And we got churches that, that are chasing all these fads and, and they want to be hip and they want to be this and they want to be relevant and they want to be that. Listen, now, listen, I don't want to be old-fashioned. I, uh, I, I don't want to, to, to be backwards. I don't want to be that. But what I don't want to be is not pleasing the Lord. Oh, I got all the new answers. No, you don't. The basics is this book. I, I want to please the Lord. You say, oh, you're just out. Uh, you know what? That's too outdated expected people to honor the Lord. You know, to not have sin in their life, to, to love each other, to forgive each other, to be kind to each other. You know what? That's old date. No, 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 no. It might be old fashioned to some. But it's an expectation that the Lord has given us. We need to live in that. We need to boldly live for the Lord. We need to stick by the stuff. Don't compromise the gospel. Are you saved today? Today's a great day to be saved. What's the gospel? The gospel is what Jesus has done. He's came. He was born on this earth and lived a life so that he could bleed and die and sacrifice for you, for your sin. I don't have any sin. You do. The Bible says that we are born speaking lies and that our righteousness, the very best that we can do, is just like filthy rags. And in, in, we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. And so, therefore, we need a Savior. And so the gospel came. Jesus came. And guess what? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and it's a lot more than just looking at a cross uh, on your wall it's a lot more than doing that it is a personal relationship with the lord jesus i want to encourage you don't compromise the gospel and we see here in verse 20 of chapter 11 look at verse 22 with me just for a little bit things were happening the church was becoming great People were believing. They were turning from God. They were becoming holy. Verse 22. This is another basic of a great church. Then tidings of these things came to the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Who, when he came and he had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man. This is key. And full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people were added unto the Lord. Now, uh, a basic of a great church is spirit-led leaders. Possessing spirit-led leaders leaders this was the mark people were getting saved the gospel was going forward and the church there in jerusalem said man we got all these people getting saved we need to make sure they have some leadership we, we have a culture that doesn't like that word they don't like authority but god likes it and he knew that there needed to be some leadership here. And so they sent Barnabas. He was a good man. The Bible says he was full of the Holy Ghost. And so it's easy. We've seen it in our day, haven't we? We've got some dear friends. They move to a certain state. And they write back and say they're really having a hard time finding a good church. They're like, oh, we, we knew of this church, but they've changed. It's different. You see, leadership is so very important in the church. It's easy for a church to lose its way. They begin to drift. They can go off course. A lot of things can tempt the church to do that. Well, if we get more people, we get more money. Or if we do this, we do that. Uh, 
Uh, but we don't want to get caught in the latest cultural fads. Aren't you glad? Those of you that wore the mullet, aren't you glad that you didn't have to stick with it for the rest of your life? Now, some of you still have it, but I won't point you out. But sometimes churches are doing that. They're getting caught up in these cultural fads about this and that. And what we need is good, godly, spiritual leadership. Barnabas was that man. Paul often, when he went and he started these churches, he would go back, look at chapter 14 of the book of Acts. Look what he would do. Chapter 14, if you see, look, let's see here, uh, verse 23. It says, And when they had ordained them elders or pastors in every church and had prayed with them fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And so, guess what? They were going around starting these churches. And you know what he said? He went back to them and he ordained them elders. He said, you need leadership. We need the godly leadership. Kind of like Barnabas, full of the Holy Ghost. A good man. We need this kind of leadership. Leadership is very, very important. And so they sent Barnabas. Barnabas was an amazing individual. If you studied Barnabas' life, you'd see that he was right in the middle of things without even being mentioned. Right in the most important times in history, Barnabas had a huge part in it. And what was he? He's just a servant. He's just a servant. He's a servant that loved the Lord. He's a leader. He went down there, began teaching the Word of God. and was a huge, huge part in history. You say, what are you talking about? Well, if you go back, I want you to notice verse number 25 of chapter 11. It says, then all these people are getting saved. All these people are being encouraged. All these people are being added. And then Barnabas says, hey, man, I need some help. So what does he do in verse 25? He departs and he goes to Tarshish. And he goes there to seek Saul. And you know how he knows Saul? Because he was the one earlier in chapter 9 that when all the disciples uh, were scared of Paul, they want nothing to do with him because he was a pretty good persecutor. I mean, he, spent, he, he was there. They laid at his feet Stephen's coat or the coat. And he was the ringleader of all of this persecution. But God gloriously saved him. He got saved on the road to Damascus. He came to Jerusalem looking for the disciples. And they wanted nothing, no part of it. But guess who interceded? Barnabas. You know what he's doing? He's loving people. Treated him for who he was. He says, hey, he's a believer. He treated him right. And because of that, some six years later, he says, I remember... That guy, Saul, I remember Paul, he said that God has called him to the Gentile ministry. I heard what he said there. Let me go get him because I've got all these Gentiles that are all coming to Christ and they need to be discipled and they need to be taught. And you know what? I need help. And so he goes and he gets Paul. This is amazing because they had godly leadership, spirit led leadership. He went and found them. And this would be the great church. The great first Gentile church. The church that where Paul would begin his great ministry. And from there on, all 13 books, Ephesians, all those books were all because of this church here in Antioch. I think leadership is so important. We've got good churches in our community here, in Apache Junction and Mesa. You know, they're not churches anymore. They used to be gospel preaching churches, right? Loving the Lord, doing ministry, doing service. And there might be various reasons for that, but I tend to believe a lot of it is leadership. 
And we need some spirit-led and spirit-filled leadership. It's so vital. Look at Acts chapter 20. Paul is telling them about this, the, the vitality and the importance of spiritual leadership in your church. Man, this isn't good enough. Man, this isn't good enough just for you to attend church. Listen, it's time for you to step up and say, hey, I need to be a spiritual influencer. I need to be spiritual in my family. I need to do what God wants me to do. I just can't let my wife lead me around all the time and tell me what to do. Hey, listen, my wife tells me what to put on every Sunday morning. I'll admit it. And I'm glad because she's got good taste. She's like, yeah. Hey, some of you have seen me come to church when she's been out of town. And you know, I'm a total hot mess. Okay, you know that. I don't even know where I'm going with this after this right here. I'm coming back. Ah! Oh, yeah. But man, listen, it's time for you to start making godly spiritual decisions that would influence your family. I mean, there's some things you don't need to talk about. Now, in our family, we go out to eat sometimes and yeah, we discuss it. And I say, can I pick? And they say, no. And I'm like, okay. But there's some really, really important things that, you know what? We need to be have our... We need to be good men, men of character, so much that we would be trusted with this amazing job of going down and being a part of these new believers' life. We need to be godly men, full of the Holy Ghost, good reputation. And this is what we need to do in our families. I think maybe it's time for some of us to, 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 to quit just getting by. Maybe it's time for you to step up. Maybe it's time for you to get right. Maybe it's time for you to say, you know what? I want to be a leader. I want to be something for God. I want to do a, uh, some great work. I want to be a part of a great church. I like Barnabas. He was an amazing man, an encourager. That's kind of what his name means, if you will. But he was smart enough to know, man, I got my hands full here. I'm going to need some help. Can't do it on my own. And so what is he, the Lord puts on his mind. Remember that guy? Remember that guy that we told to go back to Tarsus because we didn't want us to get killed because of him? Remember that guy? Let's call him up. That's the kind of guy we need now. And so this is interesting. Spirit-filled leaders. Look at Acts chapter 20. I, I know I took you there. I got off track just a little bit. Look at verse 28 with me. Leadership is so important. Uh, I, I, I consider myself to be a hard worker. Um, I like to work. Uh, I like to produce. I, I, I like to get things done. I like to see the final things. And, uh, you know, just personality-wise and all that. And uh, I've had jobs in the past where the leadership has not been very good. And it's hard. It's hard to be a good worker with bad leadership. It's hard to produce and to be effective when, man, where, what are we doing? Where are we going? I don't know. It's hard. But we need some good leaders. And it's vital in the church. Look at what he says in verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and do all the flock over which... The Holy Ghost have made you overseers. And so the elders, the pastors here, have been made overseers. And there's a huge responsibility here. And we understand that. And what is the responsibility? We see from verse 28 that you're overseers to do what? To feed the church of God. That's a huge responsibility. A leader has to know how to feed the church of God. How does the flock of God get fed? By the word of God. So the word of God has to be taught. Has to be preached. Has to be taught, consulted. And I think we're missing that. In so many of our cultures. Let me encourage you. 
Leadership is important. Not only is he to feed the flock, he's to oversee it. God made him overseers to be godly leadership. And then notice it says at the end there, of verse number third, uh, 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. What's he talking about here? here here's why leadership is important. Uh, God has made the pastor the overseer to feed you and to protect you. you. You all have the mental picture of a herd of sheep or a flock of sheep and a shepherd. His job is to take them and so they can have good pasture and so that they can be happy. You take them by still waters, right? And, and, and sets a table, a mesa, if you a table before them and, 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 and give them a good life. But there's also wolves out there. And the leadership has a responsibility to, to protect the flock. To protect them. It says here that they'll, notice this, it says they'll enter in among you. So they're, so this is why you need Leadership. Oh, we're going to do this. And then how did the idea change? Well, there's, there might be some wolves among you. I was really, I thought we were going to do that. And now we're doing. And so leadership is so important. Um, notice these wolves for a moment. Uh, not sparing what? Oftentimes what happens, and I want you to just to, to, to notice this. If you interact and you um, engage and you are having relationships and, and a person is very, very, very selfish and what their concern is is what they want and what they need and what they, and you hear it, you hear it, what I need, what I want, what I care about, what I... See, what they're doing is they have no concern for the flock because it's about them, right? So they're not sparing the flock. They're going in there and just wreaking havoc because it's, that's what they do. A wolf does what a wolf does. And so if you see somebody that has these uh, uh, character traits of selfishness, be careful. Because we, as a body of Christ, are to edify one another. We are to be members in particular, one of another. That means that I care about you like I care about me. That's what that means. And wolves come in, they don't, they don't care about the flock. They don't care. We got, we got really smart people, and guess what? You know what? I love having people in church, by the way. Thank you for being here, amen. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I really am. I wish we had more people in this room today. I really do. I love people. But you know what? Uh, I've had to tell a few people, I don't think we're going to be a right church for you. You say, Pastor, you told them? Yes. Yes. You say, Did you, were you mean? No. I just said, you know, hey, yeah, we don't do it. No, that's not, we're not interested in that. No, no, you cannot uh, get the names of all my members so that you could call them and solicit and sell something to them. No, you can't. Out of here. Because why? They don't care about the flock. They care about themselves. They care about their numbers. I invited somebody to church and they thought, ooh, this is going to be a great idea because now my sales pool is now great. I came to church. Now I can sell all my stuff to everyone else in here because I already sold it to everybody I knew. So I need to build my sale pool here. Well, they found out pretty close soon that I'm like, I'm not about that. We're about one another here. And we care about the flock. We care about one another. And so we have to protect the flock. So as your pastor, guess what? I've got to do that from time to time. 
divisions. We have to talk about these things at time to time. This is our responsibility, and I understand that. But this comes with godly spiritual leadership. And this is why it is a basic truth to a great church, like the church here at Antioch, is, you know what? You need people that will boldly, are boldly on fire proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus, and you need people like Barnabas who are spiritual, God-filled leaders. We need that. Don't settle for carnality. Don't settle for any of this. You need someone spirit-led and spirit-filled. You ever see somebody that lives their life? Uh, uh, you know, we got a lot of <clears throat> we got a lot of uh, people that think Hollywood is real. <laughs> like, <clears throat> like they're so they're so happy. They're so happy. It's farthest from the truth. It's farthest from the truth. You got people all over saying, you know what, if I could just do this, and if I could just do that, and if I could look like this, then I'll be happy. And you know what the church has done? The church has says, well, we need leaders, and he's got a, oh, he's, oh, he could preach. He could really tell a story. Oh, he, you know what? He's dynamic. Well, what we need to know is, is he spirit-led? Is he spiritual? Because if you don't have that, you don't, that other stuff won't last. It won't last. Now, we don't want someone to bore you and put you to sleep. We, we get all of that. But we, we don't need the best looking one. You already got them, you know, you know. But churches don't need that. They need spirit led, spirit filled people and leaders. And godly men that are in the pew that say, you know what? I am going to be spirit-led. And I'm going to do what is right. I'm going to stand for what is right. And I, you know what? When you're a leader, oh, the darts come. And so, what's our job? Would you pray for your leaders? we got men in here that are serving behind the scenes. Pray for them. They're doing work. Satan doesn't like it. Satan so doesn't like them growing and helping and preaching and inviting. And Satan so don't like that one bit. So he'll battle you left and right. He'll battle me as a pastor. I mean, he, all day long. And so we need people to be praying for your spiritual leaders because that's the mark. That's the basics of a great church. People ask me, Pastor, how's your church? I love my church. If you don't know that, you don't know me. I love my church. I love it. I love my people. I love to see you every single morning, Sunday morning. Sunday morning, okay? <laughs> Not every morning. Sunday morning. No. <laughs> it's enough sometimes. No, just kidding. You know, hey, I love my people. I really do. And if you know me, you know that to be true. Um, and we need... Uh, we have a great church. I really think we have a great church, but we know it's not perfect. And some churches are really good at certain things. And, and some churches are really not so good at some other things. And maybe there's some evaluations that needs to be done. And maybe God needs to raise up some leaders in those other areas so we get better at that and, and, and do what God wants us to do to please the Lord. But I think we've got a great church. We've got a great family spirit and a great... And, and these are the things that I'm passionate about. And these are the things that I'm thankful for. But as I read about Antioch and how, man, they got together. They boldly preached Christ. And people believed. And people were changed. And they made a difference. Boy, I want to make a difference. Sometimes we could just kind of get used to kind of doing our thing. And I, I'm challenged right here to be bold. Do you believe it? If you believe it, you can be bold about it. You say, Pastor, I'm not bold. Why aren't you bold? The fact that Jesus saves, that he's the answer for the world today. Why don't we save that? Why aren't we bold about that? Maybe we've let 
the world turn us back? See, Jesus, we turn to God. But maybe the glittery things of this world has changed us so that we're not bold like we should. We need some godly leaders. Maybe it's time for you to step up. Maybe it's time for you to do that in your home. But these are the marks. These are the basics of a great church. Antioch was a great church. Next week, we're going to talk about a couple more specific elements that made them so great. I encourage you to come back next Sunday. We'll finish this chapter up, okay? But what is God speaking to you about? Boldly proclaiming the gospel? Let me ask you, are you saved today? Today's a great day to be saved. Are you a sinner? Yes, I'm a sinner. Have you been saved? Or do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die, you'd be with him? Do you know that? That's the gospel. What did Jesus do? He died for you, took your place, was buried in the grave for you so that you wouldn't have to experience death, hell, and that grave. And he is ascended on high so that he can be victorious over death. And now he can live in you through trusting Jesus as your Savior. Let me encourage you. Are you saved today? You say, Pastor, how can I be bold? You let the gospel, if, you, if you're saved today, you got to let that, you got to kindle that flame. If you know Christ is your Savior, you need to kindle that flame. You need, to, you need to put some air in that. You need to get that flame hot so that people can say, Woo, something's going on over there. Now, please don't be obnoxious. That's my job. Amen. <laughs> don't be rude. Don't be, but, but be bold. Here's a thought. Almost everyone else is very bold about their life. They're bold about their sin. They're bold about their choices. They're so bold, they try to tell you what to believe. It's our turn to be a great church by boldly proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ and recognizing in order to be a great church, we have to possess spiritual, spirit-led leadership. Let's do that together. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. And I'm just mindful of this truth we talked about. There's no perfect church. But there's a lot of good churches, a lot of good people. But Lord, this church in Antioch was great. And they were great, Lord, because they boldly proclaimed you. Lord, I pray that we would be the ones to do that here in Apache Junction. We recognize, Lord, that there was spirit-filled leadership that could feed and protect and oversee. Lord, raise up men. Raise up leaders in their areas to lead in a spiritual manner where you would want them to lead. Lord, we ask that you just bless this morning. Lord, meet the needs. Lord, we have lots of needs, lots of hearts, lots of questions. And Lord, let your word be foundational in our life. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's stay together. Spirit of prayer. Instruments can go play. Just one. I want to just to have a, a, a time where you make a decision. Lord, I, I'm going to be bold. I'm going to step up to be that leader that you want me to be. I'm going to be that spiritual, spirit led leader. And this is that time. You said, Pastor, maybe I'm not saved. I, I'm, I want to know for sure. Come on down. I will show you from the Bible how you can know for sure that if you died, you'd go to heaven. I can show that from you. I can show that to you. From the Bible, simple. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon him to save you.
Just thank the Lord for the great church, for good people, great place. Thank you for your kind attention. We're going to have a word of prayer here. We'll be dismissed. I want to encourage you to come back tonight. We've got a special message all planned for tonight. In fact, Pastor Al is going to be preaching. And I, I think I've probably, over the 17 years I've been here, I've probably uh, been to this book of the Bible in, during a sermon, but I've never probably preached out of this book of the Bible that Al is going to preach out of tonight. And so... Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And so you come back tonight, 6 o'clock, very special message from Al, and we're going to be blessed tonight. 6 o'clock right here. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for taking care of us and meeting our needs. Thank you for all that you have done. We ask, Lord, that you would just bless us this afternoon. Uh, Lord, help us to be that spirit-led, spirit-filled leader in our home and in our life and our responsibilities. And Lord, I do ask, Lord, that we be able to be bold as we go out and proclaim you to the world. We pray this in your name. Amen. God bless you, folks. You are dismissed.